Revisit the Garden Gnome Emporium is this week's episode from Percy Jackson and the Olympians, and it's already a huge step up from the first two episodes. Not to say they were bad, but we're going to get into why I really liked this episode. So let's dive into Season 1, Episode 3, Revisit the Garden Gnome Emporium from Percy Jackson. Now remember, I'll be starting with the non-spoiler stuff and then going into the spoiler stuff. And admittedly, I don't have too much to say in the non-spoiler section, unfortunately, so apologies everyone who wants to, you know, hear a bit more in the non-spoiler section. But honestly, the main things I have to say is this is a fantastic episode. It does still have some issues that I've got with it in regards to how some things are kind of flowing out in terms of the plot. There's some elements that are a little bit too fast, specifically the fight scenes, which is a little bit disappointing. But overall, acting has taken a huge improvement and I think it's related to the directing in some way because this episode was directed by Anders Engstrom and I apologize if I'm saying that wrong. So a different director to the first two episodes. Not to say that the director for the first two was bad, I just think you can see an improvement in the directing already because the cast are already feeling so much more gelled like they kind of they're bouncing off each other incredibly well i mean annabeth percy and grover are just they are the standouts in this episode as well as the character of medusa which isn't a spoiler (laughs) this is her episode and you know this was shown in the next time at the end of the previous episode but they are that the chemistry between the cast has already picked up a lot and i think that may be related to directing because there's definitely it's not they're feeling a lot more directed but it definitely feels like the cast has kind of gotten a sense of their characters at this point. Uh, there's a little bit more sass that's coming from Percy. There's a little bit more emotion coming from Walker's acting as well. Um, and same with like Leah's Annabeth and even Grover's sort of like struggles in being a mediator. It's very much central in this episode. And I think it's just, it's a really strong development of the characters already, especially considering for Annabeth in particular, we didn't really have much time with her in the previous episode and we do kind of feel that a little bit at the start of this one but immediately we're getting so much more of a sense of her character and again Leah is a standout she's doing an amazing job as Annabeth and you can just feel the strength of Annabeth's character uh, there are some moments with dialogue where I feel like they're kind of hamming it up a little bit too much with the sort of strong female character conversation which I don't think is necessary. Like there's one bit of dialogue that I will talk about in the spoiler section where I'm kind of like, that could have been cut because it's implied, but this is just a me situation. Overall, strong character chemistry, stronger storyline in this one as well. It felt a lot more weighty in the moments and it didn't feel like we were rushing. The pacing has drastically improved in this episode. And I think like what I was saying in the previous videos, I think we're just gonna see it get stronger each time they've really kind of got their bearings at this point in terms of the script and I just really enjoyed it I don't really have anything else to say beyond solid acting solid story and pacing improvement and I think that leans itself into the script writers in this one but also into the directing I think the directing and cinematography has improved quite a bit in this episode in particular it is mostly positive for this episode I just really really enjoyed it um so yeah immediately a step up and i'm looking forward to next week's but that is all for the non-spoiler section sorry everyone into the spoilers now i have my notes ready it is like four pages worth so we're just going to go into basically all the beats that go on oracle scene at the start really good really enjoyed it found out a lot of people forgot that in the books the oracle's vision is actually of gabe and his poker friends um, a lot of people seem to really be really confused about this, um, which admittedly I had forgotten about it until I was kind of like, oh wait, no, that did happen in the books, which was like a secondary thought. Um, was never explained how it works in the book, so I understand why people are confused about it, but I kind of liked it. It was kind of funny, um, but again, a little bit weird. <laughs> the main criticism I think I have for this episode is the choosing scene where Percy chooses who's going to join him on the quest. Mainly, be- like, okay slightly jump ahead I understand where they were going with it because of what happens at the end where Percy says I chose Annabeth because I didn't think we'd ever be friends 
we get the reason, but we get it at the end of the episode. Him choosing Annabeth at the start, like immediately going, Annabeth, made no sense to me, if I'm honest. And the reason he gives in that scene of um, someone who would continue the quest, even if I go down a different path, she would push me down the stairs to make sure the quest was secured. I mean, yes, but also how does he know this? Clarice is more likely to push him down the stairs. We've not gotten enough explanation of Annabeth's character or had enough interactions between Annabeth and Percy for him to be like, oh yeah, she's the right person because of these reasons. Because currently the only things he knows about her is what he's been told by Luke. And yeah, Luke did say, you know, she's been desperate for this quest. And she pushed him in the river to show that he was the son of Poseidon. But other than that, his reasons were just kind of a little bit odd to me. And then, again, it did loop back around at the end, but I think it needed a better setup for that to feel more significant by the end. I do like the scene that we have between Luke and Percy where Percy says, look, I wanted to choose you, but I know that if I did and had you and Annabeth, if she wanted to do something, you would side with her because that's what you said. And I like... I do really like that they are building up Luke and Percy's relationship because that was something that was really not done in the books at all. Um, and like obviously Luke giving him the, f the, I was about to say the flowers, the flying shoes. Oh, maybe I was combining the word. Anyway, Luke giving him the flying shoes and all these sort of things. It's just, it was a really nice moment between them and I really enjoyed that. Um, and then we get into the actual going on the quest and the tensions that are there from the get go are so good and it makes a lot of sense as well specifically because of the fact that beyond Percy and Grover these guys do not know each other well I guess I'm Grover and Annabeth kind of but they don't know each other they've never worked together this is the first quest that any of them have ever really done Grover I suppose has gone out into the world to do things and find demigods and it has been dangerous but this is the first thing that they've got going out which has a deadline which has danger at every turn and immediately there's a conflict of personalities, there's a conflict of direction. And Annabeth stepping up and being like, look, this is how we're going to do it. And Percy being like, wait, I thought I was in charge. And Grover's response was like, really? <laughs> you thought you'd be in charge? Not obviously saying that, but kind of implying that a little bit. Because, yeah, he doesn't know what he's doing. Of course Annabeth's going to be in charge. Even though she probably should step back a little bit. But just the differences of Annabeth being this not like stuck up but kind of stuck up to a degree person who literally has this is our goal this is what we're doing this is where we're going this is how we're doing it and Percy who obviously has a whole other agenda of yeah I'm not really doing this quest I'm just going to go get my mum and Grover who is stuck between the two of them and is so conflict avoidant that he's freaked out about hurting anyone's feelings and Grover buddy I hear you I feel you someone give him a hug <laughs> But it's that was a hundred percent the highlights of these episode of this episode was the relationship between these three characters and even the individual ones. Percy and Grover know each other more; they are closer in a relationship. And Annabeth is very much a on her own sort of person. She is someone who is completely self sufficient. Which, I mean, she what was it? Luke said that they found her when she was really young. Sounds like she's had to be self sufficient for a lot of her time because. She's only 12 right now. How much younger was she? Uh, it's just fascinating. Love it. Love that we're seeing so much of these dynamics between it. Love that we're also getting the exposition in a much better way, if I'm honest, in this episode. Like the fact that Percy can't go by air because if he goes in a plane, that's Zeus's domain. He can be shot out of the sky. Um, and I'll talk about a thing related to the books in regards to that later on because that was something that I think they missed. Or at least, I think it may have been cut, which is unfortunate because it probably shouldn't be because there's no context now. Um, and then we have a whole conflict with uh, the two Furies on the bus, including Alecto, who was the one from the first episode. She's back already. And what I found really interesting is that she offers Annabeth a deal. Give me Percy and you can carry on doing what you need to do because he's going to slow you down anyway. And I like that she does not, like, obviously Grover and Percy don't know that she's 
been given this deal but she immediately goes to her team and says look we've got to get off this bus so we know immediately that yes she's picking fights with percy and she does not like percy from the looks of it because he is kind of useless but she still wouldn't turn on him she still wouldn't give him over so she can do the quest as she needs to and then she kills a fury to protect him just immediately just the beats of this and the growing connection between the characters is already starting out so strong and then we have a few more arguments but yeah but just continuously seeing the back and forth and the push and pull between percy and annabeth they are literally at each other's like they are knocking heads so much so and grover is just <laughs> he's the kid between two parents who doesn't like that they're arguing but doesn't know what to do that is very much the vibes that are happening here and i love it so much um, not for him because it sucks for him but it's just a really interesting development between the characters relationships and then they get to auntie m so they've been traveling through the woods after having to get off the bus they're chased by electo but they find themselves at auntie m's which is immediately revealed to us as medusa's hideout um and electo doesn't come any closer because medusa comes out and she's like hey she's gonna kill you I'm going to give you food, which option do you prefer? And they're quite literally stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I'm like, well, no, because <laughs> she turns into stone. Um, <laughs> and so they go in to get some food because Electo is not going to be able to follow after them. And this is the thing that I really loved in this episode is the better storytelling of medusa now i'll talk about this a bit more in books but i really did not like medusa's portrayal in the books but they have made medusa more of a sympathetic character she talks about in the episode how you know she like annabeth and this is the whole thing she is talking specifically to annabeth in this whereas in the book there's a bit more percy related interaction and she just hates annabeth from the get-go she doesn't hate annabeth in this she is just kind of sad and almost sad for her to a degree because she talked about how she loved Athena once she prayed to her she gave her offerings she gave everything to her and yet she never heard a word from Athena and then one day a god Poseidon comes along and says that he loves her and he makes her feel seen like she's never felt seen before and then Athena says that she is well basically Athena was embarrassed and she said she's dishonored her so cursed her with the gorgon snakes and Annabeth doesn't believe it and admittedly it's an interesting mix of some of the Greek mythology I believe I liked what they did with it because it leads back into the conversation that happens in the first episode where not all monsters are monstrous Medusa may be physically a monster in that she turns people to stone but as she says in the episode she was the victim of the gods egos really poseidon seduced her to get back at athena and athena punished her to get back at poseidon she was caught in a godly tattle basically she did nothing wrong but because the gods can't fight each other they decided to take it out on her and i know i just i like the connotation that comes with that because it then from how we see it in the episode makes Annabeth and Percy think about it. Annabeth immediately does reject it because she's so loyal to her mother. Um, but Percy, we kind of get a hint of that a little bit more, especially considering he then goes to have a secret talk. Well, not secret, the guys know that they, he, he's gone and followed her. But he then talks with Medusa privately. Medusa even says that Poseidon is a monster. Um, or, tr was it monster? I think I may have gotten that wrong. But basically, he refers to Poseidon in the negative and he says oh i never heard my mum talk about him that way and then she asks where is your mum now because yeah poseidon is technically <laughs> responsible for everything that's then happened to his mum. well the gods not poseidon necessarily the gods are responsible to what happened to his mother so it's leading a lot of interesting commentary on are the gods really good or are the demigods only loyal to the gods because they are their parents um, which I'm glad they brought that commentary in because there were other elements that needed to have that commentary that didn't. So this is the first time we're kind of getting the questioning of the gods' actions and motivations. 
So I think it was just a really interesting commentary and I just really, really liked it. I like that they've updated it. I've liked that they've not had the dodgy elements that are there in the book and it just leads to the interesting commentary and the round back of kind of this is what was talked about in the first episode. Here is a continuation of it. And um, yeah, she does eventually then attack them because, uh, you know, they try to leave and escape because they have no interest in taking on her well, in Percy's case, he has no interest in agreeing to her thing of killing his friends, uh, well, killing his quest mates, because uh, he doesn't consider Annabeth a friend right now, um, but killing his quest mates, and then he's like, Ugh, and then they all run out, and that's when she kind of turns. And we find out in the basement, she's kind of done it to many, many people, and she may be kind, and she has trauma, and she has experienced terrible things, but that doesn't mean that the terrible stuff that she does isn't so terrible because yeah she was a victim to a degree but she's still doing terrible things she doesn't have to but she is so very interesting commentary there and overall this whole episode is just it's just a really strong episode we've getting so many more character beats and like even after the the defeating of Medusa which was done through teamwork specifically through Annabeth and Percy because Grover accidentally flew away <laughs> um though he does come in to help a little bit but by accident overall I just think it was just seeing them growing in their abilities to work together and even Percy revealing this is what the prophecy said that I would be betrayed by a friend uh I think it was just it was nice to see that he was admitting this to them the fact that he'd said Grover would come because he didn't believe that Grover would turn against him and he invited Annabeth because he doesn't consider her a friend so she he wouldn't be being portrayed by a friend and then kind of also the hurt on Annabeth's face which I thought was interesting because yeah they've already kind of gone through a few bits here but it was a little bit too soon for me in particular but I liked it overall but it was the fact that he he's confused like he's he doesn't know who to trust he doesn't know what to do he feels really alone and then there's just some opening moments that happen. Uh, but that was in regards to Grover telling them both off for continuing to argue. And he opens up about the things to do with them of the hat Annabeth has is from her mum, which I'm pretty sure Percy knew about in the previous episode. But anyway, and then Percy finding out that his mum is alive is a really hard thing and Annabeth has to stop being so hard on him. And it was after a moment as well that Grover himself has been through a devastating moment of finding his uncle Ferdinand, someone he looked up to and cared about, didn't make it beyond New Jersey. And it was just a really nice moment for Grover as well. But that whole moment of them kind of working together and finally opening up about things to each other shows the start of the development of that relationship between them, which I really, really appreciate. Because it'd be weird if they kind of started getting on from the get go in this episode because they don't know each other <laughs> they know each other individually to a degree but they've never worked together they've never done these things together they don't really know much about each other they all have different intentions for this quest except maybe Grover because he's just kind of ray of sunshine and there but overall super strong episode super strong start to the characterization and the relationship between the trio uh, love that we still do have them sending the head of Medusa to Olympus because as Percy says I am impertinent um, and it was all into the fact that the gods punished Medusa for something that wasn't her fault and so this is that way of kind of sending it back and being <laughs> kind of giving the middle finger but not because it's the kids show and then Lin-Manuel Miranda jump scare at the end with Hermes delivering the head um, you know love that but yeah overall super strong episode really loved it but to get into the things in regards to the book book related stuff honestly not too well there, was, there were more changes in this episode i think than in the previous ones like more drastic changes instead of sort of like aesthetic based changes well not but you know what i mean but i think the changes they made here are the ones that are the better changes the medusa storyline so much stronger so much better so much less problematic because in the books she was a woman who was in a burqa of a sort of not I don't think there's ever a name given to it and she like hisses when she speaks so they're saying she has an accent 
and then she was like obsessed with the Poseidon which is why she doesn't want to kill Percy but she wants to kill the others they don't know she's Medusa until it's revealed a little bit too late um because they're lured in by the food <laughs> um and yeah so I'm just really glad that they've kind of moved away from that and into this version where Medusa has a different characterization she is someone who is a victim who has become a perpetrator so to speak and I don't know I just I really like this you know, interpretation I really like how this is presented again I never really liked how it was presented in the books it was kind of gross um and just like really weird choices but um what they've done in the show really really love that I'm going to give Jessica Parker Kennedy who plays Medusa a huge credit because she wow the emotions that she is portraying in that scene of just the hurt the exhaustion the almost sort of like defeated attitude until that turn really well done really love that fantastic stuff and yeah overall Medusa fantastic changes really happy with that love that whole thing uh the one thing that I think well two things actually both in regards to Luke so we're in the book spoiler section we know Luke's the bad guy well one of them but you know he he's the one who's caused he's the thief he's caused all these problems and basically there are two things in this episode that I think needed to be there to start seeding the hints one Luke being more disappointed and kind of angry towards his dad so we have the whole scene of him giving his shoes to Percy which are a gift from his dad and we kind of get a little bit of a hint because he's kind of sounding a bit not morose but he's sounding a bit disappointed and kind of a bit exhausted talking about it but we've not had him at any point really talk about why he doesn't like his dad the problems he has with his dad where he got his scar from which is related to his dad interestingly we had this whole moment of the gods are assholes sometimes from Medusa and not from Luke I think that needed to come from Luke at some point not necessarily that the gods are assholes but that he has a problem with his dad that he has these daddy issues but it didn't happen additionally in regards to the shoes and this is where this is the bit that I mentioned where I feel like there was a scene that was cut um when they mention about Percy not being able to fly because of Zeus in the books Chiron then also says oh you can't use the flying shoes from Luke it's a great gift um Percy's thinking but he can't use them because it'll be dangerous because he'll technically be in the air which is also Zeus's domain so he gives them to Grover now they are given to the Grover in the episode but we don't see it happen we don't know why it's happened and that's why I feel like there was a cut scene where Percy asks oh does that mean I can't use Luke's flying shoes and they go uh better not risk it and so he's like okay Grover you can have them if you want to sort of situation but we don't have that so there's no context for why Grover has them which considering what happens later in regards to those shoes we kind of really needed that moment because currently we don't understand why Percy doesn't have the shoes we need at least a line of why and it's why I think they cut a scene that would have given that context but that was honestly kind of all of it for the book related elements there wasn't like there wasn't anything that was annoyed that was removed um or things that were changed because I think the changes that they did for this episode make a lot of sense in comparison to some of the ones from the previous episodes I just think there are just some things that are missing like the shoe related element but um honestly overall for this whole episode seriously strongest episode so far um, but yeah I can really feel it in this already it feels so much more improved from those two episodes uh, exposition is so much stronger because it feels so much more natural instead of just reading from a script the dialogue is already so much more natural that was something I forgot to mention so the whole thing of Electo saying to Annabeth you really are the pride of Athena her strongest child maybe this oh no you are truly the pride of Athena the strongest demigod child that did not need to be there I don't know it was just it felt very much kind of like yeah Annabeth is strong girls are strong like it didn't feel like a natural line to say her saying you really are the pride of Athena or whatever it was <laughs> I feel bad I've forgotten it I've watched it twice already <laughs> I don't know it just it 
it felt a little bit like we need to say that she's strong instead of you know show us that she's strong because we've not currently had moments that show this yet you're just telling us that she's the strongest demigod same as when luke told us that she is you know the best strategist like she's the best demigod in camp and stuff like that. again show us don't tell us and it just felt like an unnecessary line in general it didn't need to be there where was i going yeah <laughs> for the overall episode character relationships so much stronger character growth so much stronger acting is so much stronger in this as well the comedy is hitting a lot more the emotional moments are hitting a lot more and the build-up for what's coming next is also working really well i'm really excited to see what happens next week so um yeah uh for my rating of this episode i would give it what was i doing them out five i was i would give it probably about 4.5 if i'm honest um there are still maybe yeah no, 4.3 we'll give a 4.3 out of five um still like super strong do you think it could improve a little bit more but overall really happy loved it a lot uh jessica parker kennedy needs to be in more roles she's a fantastic actor um and yeah that's kind of all i have to say so i hope you've enjoyed this review let me know in the comments your own thoughts on this episode again be careful for spoilers for future stuff for people who may not have read the books and um yeah be sure to subscribe check out my patreon check out my books and uh thank you for tuning in and i'll see you all next time